welcome to Mission Creek Church, everybody. We're going to open worship. Uh, yeah. Father God, I just pray that um, you are blessed this night tonight as we gather here and worship you, God. Um, tonight we, we just we praise you for your death and resurrection. We thank you for all things that we have. And it's blessed this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Just, just go ahead and talk. Don't worry okay. So, um, last weekend, um, I was at the church, and I want to ask the kids what their uh, favorite part of children's church was, so that's what that video was. Um, my name is Liz, if you do not know me, and I serve on our CE board, which is our Christian Education Board, and we love having kids back there. They're so fun and goofy and energetic, and it's just... Um, Hello everyone, I'm Zach. What's up, Zach? Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Um, just wanted to come back up here. I came up last Saturday to talk about small groups this fall um, and the training we have that's starting. So if you weren't here last week, I'll just recap really quick. Uh, the church is starting small groups um, later in the fall, but we're going to have a leadership training over the summer. And so the leadership training will start on May 12th. Um, and the purpose of the training is so everyone gets on the same page. So we kind of just set the standard for small groups as, as they'll be in the future. Um, it is required, um, not because we want to be dictators and say you have to come to the training, but it's important that we all get on the same page and what small group leadership looks like. Um, because small groups can be very healthy for a church, but they can also be detrimental. So. Um, if we all just start out on the same page as leaders um, for small groups, that's important for the success later on. So I um, just wanted to come up and talk a little bit. Um, that was about it. But I just wanted to encourage everyone to pray about being a small group leader this fall. And if, if you uh, um, want to be well, and you have questions or you want to sign up for this leadership training, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. My mom just said that. So. Um, so the papers in the back, sign up, put your name down. If you want to be a leader, sign up. If you don't know if you want to be a leader or not, sign up anyway. It'll be a good time to get together and um, kind of go over what they'll be like. So. Good evening. How are you guys doing there? Thank you, Zach and Liz, by the way. Small groups, I'm excited for it. Um, and I think it's a, an important thing. I think that we've learned fundamentally how important small groups can be, especially during times like, for example, pandemics or during times of persecution. Or It's a great way to introduce new people to your church community. We're excited. But like Zach had said, I've talked to a lot of pastors that, you know, when you say, oh, we're going to start small groups, they're like, oh, so you're preparing for your first church divide. Um, there are other pastors that say, man, small groups are fundamentally important for our church to be healthy. And so we, we want to get this right. So um, um, I'm not sure if he said it like this. And once again, we're not trying to control. We just want to make sure we're on the same page, work together. We all have different gifts and perspectives. But um, if you're not a part of that leadership training thing, um, you can certainly have a Bible study at your house. But we won't um, sanction that as a church. If uh, you want to lead a small group or Bible study, you have to come to those 16 weeks. Make sure we're on the same page there. So um, the kids thing, isn't that cute? I don't know if you guys can hear it, but I love it. And, uh, and sometimes here we can sit here and it can be quiet or whatnot, but um, if you want to experience life and fun and excitement and see people that really want to be at church, 
Um, you should go in the back on a Saturday night, or even on Sunday morning, now that we're getting more kids. I love it. We have a lot of kids back there. It's not uncommon on a night like tonight to have 20 kids in that back room, and I love it to death. We want to continue building up those ministries, and we want to share the heart of uh, what their passion and vision for it is, the CE board, so that's exciting. Uh, one more thing I want to share with you real quick is Emily. You guys know Emily? Uh, she's come to both, but I think lately she's been going on Sunday. She's making these videos for kids. I think it's three videos she makes. One is a craft, one's a lesson, etc. Um, I think she's going to continue like building these things out. She might even add some things as far as like graphics go, and you know, building out the YouTube presence. But it's a great way to reach out to families with kids outside the church. We found how invaluable that tool would have been and will be for us when we couldn't meet. But here's how you can help. Because um, I've had a lot of people come to me and say, man, she does a great job. I love her energy. I love her passion. It's awesome. You know what you can do to help that grow? Like the video. Encourage. encourage her. Share the video on your Facebook. It is free. Anybody wants an expert? Free what? It's free advertising. Mm -hmm. Just free. You know, and uh, so one week I did that. She said she'll sometimes get, uh, you know, I don't know what she said, um, how many views she'll typically get, you know, maybe, you know, uh, 10 to 20. But one Sunday morning, I said, hey, you guys should share these videos out there. Get the word out there. Let other people see it. And that week that we did it as a church, she got over 300 views. Wow. It's free advertising. Click, click. Y'all can be like, everybody take your finger and do this. <laughs> Anybody not able to do that? All right, so I expect you to share her videos. Um, we're getting excited about River Valley Conference. Um, people are signed up. I love, not only people are signed up to go, but you know what I'm noticing that are really, people that are really excited up to go that are, um, wanting to grow, learn their faith, and, and gain some tools for ministry, we have a ton of younger people that are in their 20s saying, man, I'm going to go to this. And so uh, we're excited. We hope that you'll consider it. River Valley Conference, it's awesome. And uh, one more thing. Um, I think we'll talk about it tomorrow, but I guess recently I found a, a rain in the woman's bathroom. And uh, so if you're missing a rain, um, that might be it. Looks like Tim's got the envelope right there. And so uh, if you're missing a rain... And, and one more thing, by the way, speaking of brains, and they're not in here. Hannah, do you hear me? I know you're in the front entry. I saw you up there. Um, when they come back in here, by the way, speaking of brains, her and Gabe are now engaged. Isn't that exciting? It's awesome. I saw on Facebook, we had them at youth group, and it popped up on my timeline this week. And I thought, oh my, these kids, like, one of these is just a kid here, and now she's grown up, and she's getting engaged. And another kid is, I mean, it's just crazy how time goes, doesn't it? So anyways, we seem to congratulate them. Um, I'm trying to think uh, if I got anything else there. I don't know if the uh, things broke up. Looks like it might be there. Um, let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Uh, Lord, we're going to talk about the resurrection and everything that goes with it, the crucifixion, the sacrifice, all these sort of things. And Father... You know, it occurs to me that we don't celebrate this once a year. Father, that if we truly have put our faith in you, Lord, that to live for Christ, if that resurrection is a reality to you and I, uh, to us, Father, then we'll live that out in our faith daily. And Lord, that's what I would pray for all of us today, that we would live a life like the resurrection is real every day of the year, every second of every hour. Father, that's all that matters. So, Father, just give us a sense of eternity. Give us a passion for the lost. Help us to remember what a painful yet beautiful sacrifice that you had, Lord. I pray for everybody that's here today. We have different places that we come in our faith. Lord, I pray that you minister to hearts and minds. Help us to grow in our knowledge, faith, and love. Father, we give you not just tonight, but we give you our lives. Transform us for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There we go. Awesome. So, uh, Resurrection Sunday, tomorrow, as you know. And I look back at my notes last year, and last year we didn't meet for Easter. Did you know that? You know, I'm, by the way, I'm not sure what to call it. Um, I go back and forth. Like, I want to call it Resurrection Sunday. You know, I, I don't mind calling it Easter. Um, but there are also those out there that are like, well, technically, you, you know, Easter is a pagan holiday. So, you know, you anybody hear that one before? So, like, no matter what I do, somebody's going to say something to me. But whatever, you know my heart. Um, I look back last year, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and we didn't meet in person because of COVID. And so we, we did a video... Um, it was the best that we can do, but it didn't feel right. But it does feel right that we're back together. Isn't that awesome? We're not worshiping together again? Yes. Yeah. Praise Jesus. There's one clap. I love it. <laughs> so, there's two. Y'all get brownie points. So, uh, this week we're going to take a break from Nehemiah.
And uh, we want to look at uh, a message that we thought was, or I thought was appropriate for Easter weekend. And so I begin to pray and ask God, like, God, what do you have for us this week to focus on, to preach? And then the other thing I thought as I prepared this week is that often the first weekend of each month we do a communion. So that might be really good if we had a message that we could incorporate communion into that message. And, and God really confirmed that for me. That's what he wants us to do tonight by giving me a message called the brutality of the cross. The brutality of the cross. Now, I think you guys, will everybody have a communion cup there? Okay. Um, if you don't, um, raise your hand or let one of us know and uh, Vicky will get you one. See those hands there, Vicky? Thank you. Now, as we look at communion, why do we do communion? What, you know, what are we supposed to get from that? Well, if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul specifically says right there that the reason why we do communion is to remember that Jesus' body was broken and has blood was shed. He said that's what we have to remember. So that's very specifically what he wants us to draw out of communion. Now, there's many things that we can draw, self-examination, you name it, appreciation, but specifically he says, I want you to remember that Jesus' body was broken and he shed blood for us. Now, that's not the most uplifting thought, is it? To really dial down and think about that. But that's what we are to focus on during communion. It's not me making that up. That's what the scriptures teach. Okay? That's what it teaches us. Now, that may sound morbid to remember that once a month, to think back to his body being broken and blood shed, but God wants us to remember that and, and really not take it for granted. And I think we're not careful. What we can do is we can begin to what I call sanitize our memory or the thought or how we view it. And we can downplay the crucifixion. We can lessen the sacrifice. And we can begin to replace it with a more pleasant thought. And we, we may have a more pleasant thought, but often those thoughts are not accurate. They're not biblical. They're not historical. And it cheapens Jesus' sacrifice when we do that. That's what it does. The real crucifixion, that experience was brutal. It was graphic. Now, I'm not sure about tomorrow morning. Some may find this message to be dark, um, but I don't think it is. I think actually when you come around and we get to the end of it, I think it's the opposite. I think that if we really look at what the crucifixion was, it's going to magnify our love and appreciation for what Christ did for you and I. I don't know about you, I think that I appreciate him, but I can tell you right now that I don't fully appreciate him and praise him the way that he ought to. Can you all feel that? I don't, anyone can say, no, no, I perfectly appreciate and love him all the time and everything that he did. No, we all have moments of complacency, don't we? We just do. The crucifixion was brutal. So I'm calling this message the brutality of the cross, and that brutality actually comes in three forms. Emotional brutality, physical brutality, and spiritual brutality. And I'm going to break that down, and then we're going to finish something um, at the end that I think is good, which is the good news of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. Y'all ready for this? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I think when many people think of the crucifixion and, and the cross and him dying, um, this is what it conjures up in their mind. And I looked that up this week, and the, the, what they called that on the internet was called Catholic Jesus. Whatever that is, right? Okay? Um, you notice something there? It's pretty clean and PG, isn't it? Yeah. Right? I mean, I think he's got like a little cut in his side. But otherwise, it looks pretty good, you know? And uh, that may be nice, and maybe less graphic, but it cheapens Christ's sacrifice. The crucifixion and the cross was not pretty. This is a far more accurate picture of the cross and the crucifixion. Did you guys agree with that? Yes. Big difference, isn't there? That is a far more accurate depiction of the cross and the crucifixion. It was brutal. It was graphic. And so what I want to do today, briefly, as we talk about the brutality of the cross, I want to break it down a little bit, okay? And once again, I hope that it has the effect on you that it has on me, because this week, as I looked at it, man, as I looked and really got real with what happened there, man, there was a couple times I got teary-eyed, uh, there's a few times where I just wanted to pause in my, my research and just say, Father, forgive me for not always loving you like I ought to, thank you for that sacrifice, I hope it stirs up in us deeper affections for God. 
We don't want to be like the church in the book of Revelation where he says, yeah, you're doing all the right things, but you don't love me anymore because that can happen. And none of us are immune to that. Just like in a marriage, people can love each other and start generally in love, but it, that marriage can end in what? Divorce. People fall out of love. And if we're not careful, we can do that with Christ. So I want to talk about just how brutal it was. I want to consider the crown of thorns. Okay? Our head, by the way, is full of nerve endings. Man, speaking of nerve endings, and you know, somebody knows that really well, right? <coughs> she had a crown of staples on her head. Was it 63, was it? Eight. Eight. 68? Wow, that's crazy. So our head's full of nerve endings. And by the way, your head bleeds easy. Did anybody ever get a head cut? Your head bleeds like a stuck pig. Um, years ago, when I worked at the prison, um, I came back one day and I showed up at the house and I get out of the car and I have my uniform on still and I got blood on my head, you know, dripping down the side and it looked pretty macho, you know. And uh, I probably should clean it up, but as a guy, I'm like, this would be cool. Because um, I'm an idiot, but anyways. So I, I get out of my car and uh, I think that um, Brandon's friend Missy was just coming out of the house and she was there and I kind of looked like, oh my God, what happened at work, you know? A prison guard with a bloody head. And it looked pretty bad, but it was nowhere near as macho as you would think. Um, what I was doing is after work, I decided to go lift some weights. This is back when I worked out. And in between sets, I was walking around not paying attention and had a TV mounted on the wall and I didn't notice it and I bumped my head on it. Not really macho, was it? Um, it was a tummy cut. Didn't need stitch or anything. But man, did it bleed. It just bled. Because our head has a lot of nerve endings and it bleeds easy. I mean, that crown of thorns, I'm sure, was brutal. I found that picture and I thought that's probably the reaction we would have if somebody crammed that on our head, wouldn't we? It wouldn't just be like, oh, that's irritating. It would probably be painful. As I read the account of this week, they spit on him. And by the way, that sounds disgusting. Have you ever been spit on? It, it's disgusting. They blindfolded him, and they beat him. And then as they're doing that, they said prophesy, as they struck him with the palm of their hands. You ever been, anybody ever been punched? I have a few times. Um... And if you've never been punched before, I'm going to tell you, you know, it can vary depending upon where you get hit, how hard you get hit, is it the first time you've gotten hit. But uh, depending, I'm telling you that if you get punched really hard, um, that can just reverberate down to your whole body. It can, it can really be a shocking experience if you're not used to it. And that's what he's having. He's being punched, he's being hit. It said this about him. In Isaiah 52, it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted, extolled, very high, just as many were astonished at you. So he's talking about Jesus is going to be lifted up. But now Isaiah is going to go on to describe what Jesus will go through through the crucifixion. So he's about to describe what's going to happen to him. Here's what he said. It says Jesus' okay? So it says visage, that's the word they use. And in this visage, that word is describing a face or appearance. Okay? It said that his face or appearance was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of men. Some versions actually say that he was beat to the point that he was unrecognizable. That's how bad it was. And this is not even describing the scourging yet. This is not even the nails going through his hand yet. They're saying he got beat so badly that you couldn't even recognize his face. Modern day forensics would probably say they would have needed dental records to identify the body. That's what it described of what he went through for you and I. That's crazy. He was scorched. I think a lot of you know, but if you don't, and it's good for me to, to, to hear this again. We don't know how many times he was scorched, but many assume 39. He was whipped. Now, the instrument that they used was a whip that had several um, brands on it or leather straps okay, in a variety of lengths. And, and then tied in or woven into were iron balls are sharp pieces of sheep bone at different intervals. So it, it, it's sharp. And then what they would do is they would strip him out of his clothes, and his hands were tied to a post. And they would begin to whip either his buttocks, his back, or his legs. Often be done by two soldiers, or it was one soldier, they would alternate back and forth on the back. The severity of the scourging would often depend on the disposition of the soldiers. Okay? Were they in a bad mood? Did they hate that person? Well, often determine just how brutal it was. And they would do it to the state that the person was so exhausted they'd want to collapse or die. Now, I don't know, but the disposition towards Jesus was not good. 
The soldiers mocked him. I doubt they were compassionate and merciful. I had a feeling they didn't hold anything back. Okay. And by the way, once again, as I prepared this week, it just stirred my emotions. And I started just feeling bad at times that, God, you just deserve more for me. Uh, what have you done for me? I, I, deserve, I deserve what you got. And so even though it was tough to read this, it was good for me to feel again. Anybody ever feel like that? Sometimes you've lost that feeling. Right? There's times in my life where I thought, man, when I was a new believer, I seemed like I was more on fire. But this week I could feel myself getting stirred up. I'm not going to talk about this. As Roman soldiers would strike the victims back with full force, the iron balls would cause deep contusions. The leather thongs and the sheep bone would cut into the skin and subcontinuous tissue. That's what it's called, right, Hannah? Subcontinuous? Okay. I got the wrong. I wasn't sure. And then the flogging would continue. And the last race would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. The pain and blood generally set um, a person with what they call circulatory shock. The loss of blood um, may be determined how long the victim would survive. And after the scourging, often as they're going through that pain, they would be mocked by soldiers. There's actually many reports that the scourging would get so bad and brutal that it would actually expose internal organs. Did you know that? It would just tear away so much flesh you could see organs. You know, and this is one that I've often thought, but I, it never dawned on me, but as I read reports and studied this week, it was not uncommon during this that insects would land on the wounds and begin to burrow into the open wounds, the ears, the eyes, the nose of the dying victim. Of course, you couldn't swat it away because your arms and legs were secure. And it said that often birds of prey would land on the wounds. This, this is brutal, isn't it? It really was. But we're not done yet. That was just the scourging. He hasn't even got to the piercing yet. They would take these iron spikes and they would drive them through the radius, okay, the heavier the two foreign bones, the carpals, and the eight wrist bones. Now they talked about where it's probably at. Here's what they said. The probability of placement of the spikes could be between rows of carpal bones nearest the radius or through strong fibrous brand-like tissues that cover the carpals. This forms the tunnels for the various fibrous bands connecting the eight carpal bones. And they'll be driven at this location would crush or sever large median nerve. The nerve that provides sensation and movement, particularly the second and third fingers. And damage to that nerve would often cause a crawl-like reaction in the hand, where they could almost like a deformity. And they would say that nerve damage would produce excruciating bolts of fiery pain in their arms and wrists. The stress of it all would often induce arrhythmias of the heart, congestive heart failure, with rapid accumulation of fluid around the lungs. It would create breathing issues. Often they would actually suffocate to death. Did you know that? And I've had a couple times in my life because of my severe allergies, some other issues I've had with my throat where I've struggled to breathe. And I don't know about you, but I think that is the worst feeling to not be able to breathe. And let's just remember, by the way, that we deserve that. That was for us. But he took it. That should have been for our sin, our rebellion, for us breaking God's law over and over. Now, I'm not going to get into human depravity tonight, but we need to know this, that God wasn't just simply being cruel. That mankind's sin is horrific. What people have done to each other is horrific. And a price had to be paid, because if God didn't do that, that would mean that he's unjust. It would mean that he's unloving, and he's actually promoting sin and evil to stand by, so he had to do that. The physical punishment alone was horrific. We just stop right here. Just call it a night, right? But it doesn't stop right there. The cross was spiritually brutal. Did you know that? There's a spiritual brutality that Christ had to endure. Jesus became sin. He literally became sin. Now, for you and I who, who have sinned, and, and, and we're accustomed to, to being sinners, right, in our life, hopefully we're not practicing sin now, but we've all sinned, right? But he's never experienced sin. His life has been one of holiness. He's been set apart. And now he's becoming the very thing that he knows is vile, that he didn't want to become. Sin that he, was, that he knew was grotesque and he hated. He had never known sin, and now he takes that on him. Sin that has hurt his soul and his father's soul. Sin that he's seen that hurt other people. 
And they felt all the sin of mankind, so they knew how horrible it was. You knew the, the horrible effects of sin, the lives that were shattered. Every type of sin that you could think of. You know, there's some sins, right, that are casual, like, you know, um, you know, sometimes I can get impatient. That's a sin, probably, right? To all right things like pedophilia. But every sin that you can imagine was placed on him. Placed on him. Everything disgusting that human beings have done was placed on him to fulfill justice so that you and I, who repent and put our faith in Christ, could be forgiven. He took that on him. So this is Isaiah 53. Jesus has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him as stricken, spit my God, afflicted. He was wounded for our sins. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on Jesus the sin of us all. He said he took our sin and put it right on him. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was a lamb to the slaughter. A sheep before the shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. He was taken from imprisonment, from judgment, who will declare to his generation. He was cut off from the land of the living. For the sins of my people he was stricken. They made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. He had done no violence, nor was no deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased God to crush him. He has put him to grief. When we make his soul an offering for sin. So it just goes on, right? It continues. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He will see his labor and he'll be satisfied. His knowledge of my servant shall justify man. He's talking about Christ there. He will bear their sins. And I will divide him a portion with the great. And he will divide the spoil with the strong. Because he has poured out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. He took all of our sin. Not only the sin that you have committed, but the sin that you might commit in the future. He took it all. I don't even know how to put that into words, what that must have been like for him. To take sin on, to become unholy, when his whole life was to be holy. And now he has to become that ick. Has anybody ever felt icky about your sin? Right? I'm so glad I'm forgiven. But there are times in my life where I've thought back to things that I have done and just been like, ah, oh, ick. Can anybody relate to that? Mm -hmm. He took that on him. All that ick. You know, the cross was emotionally brutal also. Now, I wondered for Jesus, like, would enduring all this be emotionally easy for him? Because after all, he is God in the flesh. So he understood the significance of what he was about to do. Jesus understood eternity. He's tasted that. He knows that though he's going to suffer, what he's going to suffer is going to be for just a tiny bit of time. But he knows that for eternity that this amazing thing is going to happen. So I'm sure that this didn't bother him, right? I'm sure Jesus was very matter-of-fact about it. Like, hey, it is what it is. I'm sure he handled like a champ. He soldiered on, right? By the way, Brenda, can you hear me? If you are, would you bring me some water? My throat's sore. And if you can't hear me, I love you. Anyway. So, have you noticed in life that the anticipation of an event can actually be worse than the event itself? Has anybody ever figured that? Okay. Like, I've had some things I've had to thank you, sweeties. You do love me. You're my hero. And so... I've had it where I've got so nervous and worked up for something and actually got there, but it probably wasn't nearly as bad as I thought it was going to be. Well, here's Jesus' mental state prior to the crucifixion. Okay? As he's getting ready. We want to know what emotions he had. We well, hear his emotions. Here's what it said in Mark. It said this. They came to a place which is called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. So one he knows it's going to be tough, so he's wanting them to pray for him. Then he took Peter, James, and John with him, and they began to be troubled. I'm sorry, he began to be troubled, and he was deeply distressed. And then he said to him, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch. So you would think he'd be like, Hey, it is what it is, I gotta do what I gotta do, but yet he knows what's about to happen to him 
and he is deeply troubled. That he's so sorrowful, he said, I, I, I want to die from all the sorrow that I am feeling right now. You talk about a deep depression and anxiety, he feels it. In fact, it says this in Luke. It says, Father, if it's your will, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. See, he knows how bad it's going to be, so much so that he doesn't want to do that. He actually admits, like, I don't want to go through this. But you know what I love about him? Is even though he doesn't want to go through it, he makes a conscious choice to do it for us anyways. He ultimately says, but you know what? Your will be done. And then he continues, and here's what it says in that same scripture there. Jesus being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Is Jesus anxious about what's about to happen? Yes. He is absolutely anxious, fearful, whatever you want to call it. His emotions are a mess right now. This was hard for him emotionally. And he had anxiety. So, I can't imagine what he was feeling. I mean, he knew everything. Uh, this week I have a procedure coming up on Wednesday. I'm going to go down my throat with a scope. I have a lot of issues in my stomach, and it might lead to, to me having like a, a surgery. Um, it won't be a big deal. It's something that they do all the time. Right? It, it really isn't. But I tell you what, I'm a little anxious about this thing coming up. Right? Because that's what happens. But man, can you imagine knowing what he knew ahead of time? Everything that we talked about, he knew. It was coming for him. He had this foreknowledge of all the suffering. The Bible says that he has compassion on you and I. Because he took on human form. And one of the ways that he can relate to you and I, that he took on human suffering, sin, temptation, many ways like us, he was without sin. But because he was human, he experienced anxiety, depression, foreboding. He had all that. Here. Um, everybody having fun tonight? <laughs> no, that's not very fun, is it? Um, it's not very fun, but this is good. Because this is what really happened. This, this really is what he had to go through for you and I. And man, if, if you don't love him more after thinking about what he endured, I, I don't know what to say. I want to consider this. Now, I don't know when I'm going to die, um, when that's going to be. Uh, I've been joking because uh, uh, Keith Easty came up to me uh, a few months ago and he said he had a dream from God on number 50 and he came to mind. So I'm going to tell him, Brenda, I'm going to die when I'm 50. Right, Brenda? She keeps telling me to shut up. <laughs> I'm just trying to develop some attention from her. I don't know when I'm going to die if you don't know when you're going to die. Um, but here's what I hope for you and I. I hope it's peaceful when that time comes. I hope that we have loved ones by our side. I would hope that when that time comes for me, that I'm sitting there um, loving Jesus with my family next to me, holding hands, laughing, smiling, picking up good memories. Is that how, I mean, whenever that comes, hopefully it's not for many, many years, is that how you hope it is for you guys? I, I don't want to be alone. I don't, right? I don't want to be alone when that time comes. Think about suffering alone and dying alone and what that would be like. But you're thinking, okay, at least that Jesus, as he's suffering these painful moments, he had the Father, right? He had fellowship with the Father, who could encourage him and bring him comfort <clears throat> during these difficult moments. Because if you look at Jesus and the Father, they'd always been in close, constant fellowship. There was never a time that they'd been apart. In fact, what we see in the ministry of Jesus is during very stressful times in his life, he would make a point to get away to quiet places to spend time with who? His father. So he knew to lean on God when times were hard. And he would spend time in prayer. So now when Jesus needs the father the most, when he is suffering these terrible things, due to God's holiness and not being able to be around sin, God the Father stepped away from him. Did you know that? So he is alone. He doesn't have the Father there to, to comfort and encourage him. He has now stepped away for Jesus. It says this in Mark 15. Okay? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So now, he's going through all this and he's all alone. That word forsaken means to abandon or desert. In these last moments, he's temporarily deserted by the Father. The 
father metaphorically steps away from him. But now is he alone now, and he's suffering and dying, and all these sort of things. But we read it earlier, actually said, it pleased God the Father to crush him. Now, God's not sadistic. He took pleasure because he realized that this would be reconciliation for mankind, it would be forgiveness, you name it. He knew the beauty of what was going to happen. But it said this right here. It pleased God to crush Jesus. So at Jesus' suffering, being alone, he's also realizing that my Father is pleased doing this. Could you imagine that? Is this, is this resonating with any of you guys, or is this just me rattling on? Yeah, looking at your watch, you ready to go home? So he's forsaken from the one he loves, the Father. Even his followers have left him. Peter said he wouldn't, right? I'll never do that. I was like, yeah, you will. He'll take nothing, Peter, and you're going to run. He was truly all alone. What an emotional toll that must have been on him, suffering unjustly. It said that he was mocked. You ever been mocked in life? Soldiers mocked him. They said, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. Which, by the way, he could have. He could have, in a moment, just smashed those guys. But he didn't. They put a sign calling the king of the Jews, but that sign would be mockery. And I thought about it this week. I realized that we treat convicted serial killers who are on death row better than we treated Jesus, mankind. Even a death row serial killer is treated with respect and dignity. Even for them, the final moments, we say that you can't show cruel and unusual punishment. And they're guilty. But Jesus isn't. They said he blasphemed God. They said he made false accusations. They made lies up about him. Something he didn't do. Has anybody ever lied or accused you of something you didn't do? Isn't that frustrating? That is one of the most aggravating things when somebody has done that to you. So I remember before that... Um, when I was very young, I was still in high school, I became a manager of a movie theater. Um, and there was three of us there, I was the youngest. There was a lot of older ones, but uh, they made me a manager. Um, but then the chain decided to close the movie theater in St. Paul because it wasn't bringing enough money. So they're gonna close it and we're getting close. The final weekend, I, uh, I really got caught off guard. I was ambushed. I come to work excited, even though you know, it's uh, um, closing. You know, it was really cool to be a young manager, get that on my resume. And I come into work and the two other managers there and they accused me of stealing from a safe. And I was just caught off guard. Um, I wish I could say that I handled it with grace. I wasn't a Christian, so I, I didn't use choice words. Um, I got very angry. I was hurt, confused, upset. I, I couldn't believe that they were accusing me of this because you know what I didn't do? I, by the way, just so you know, I have stolen things in my life. I have lied, you name it. I mean, I, I've sinned. But I didn't do that. One thing they, they blamed me for, I didn't steal from the safe. And I was so upset to be accused of that. I was angry, I was hurt. I was embarrassed that others might believe that lie. Endless frustration. Or have you ever heard of cases where a rapist will be in prison for years? Because everybody thinks he's disgusting, he's a rapist, he's guilty, on and on. Family ostracizes him, and then they find out 15 years later, now they get DNA evidence, that they were innocent. Can you imagine being in that person's shoes? This is what Jesus is dealing with here. Jesus was just a terrible plague on society. He was such a bad person going around Jerusalem, raising the dead, healing the sick, restoring sight, restoring healing, casting out demons, giving people hope. How dare he? That's what he did, right? And yet, how did they repay him for all that he did? He's dying, he's suffering, rejected by the very people he's trying to save. Could you imagine if you're accused of something horrible when in actuality you're actually doing a good thing trying to help them? And I thought about it this week and what came to mind, I think it was, a, remember when they had, it was down in Atlanta, it was the Olympics, and, uh, and they found a bomb there, and I think a cop found this bomb. He's like the hero, and he clears out, and a ton of people are saved because of his heroic action, and then what happened? They started to blame him and say, well, you planted that there. This guy goes from being here to the opposite, and then later on, you know what they found out? He, he didn't plant it, he actually was a hero. Poor guy. I guess our complaints about being treated unfair in life really pale in comparison to what Christ had to go if you don't think. Mm -hmm. So next time we want to complain about something unfair, we should pause and think about what he did. He said he stirs up people, they call him a false teacher, he said he perverted the nations, he subverts government, he's a rebel. And here's what Pilate actually says. He says, I actually find no fault in him. He said, 
What evil has he done? I found no reason for him to die. Yet they still sets him to death. The Jews, like Tim had said last night, didn't even follow their own laws when they convicted him. It's the ultimate act of injustice. So we want to talk about unfair things? Man, it's there. The embarrassment. He's shamefully treated. He's stripped basically down to his underwear, naked. You know, like, doesn't even have dignity. He died in humiliation. I could go on and on and on. Everything that he went through, you know that we deserve that? That was for us. The crucifixion was not clean. It was not quick and easy. It was terrible and it was brutal. Do you know how much love it must have taken for him to endure that for us? Can you imagine? If you want to know if Christ loves you, then you need to focus on what he went through. Because that shows you how much he loves people. I mean, I just, it's crazy. Like, I, I don't want to go through this this week. He gave me this message. I'm like, God, this is so icky. Like, let, let's have a good weekend. It's Easter and we can go home with our families. I'm like, no. This is what I want you to focus on. Because when you see it for what it truly is, it magnifies how much Christ loves us. Do you all get that? Yeah. Yeah. And he loves us so much. More than I deserve. Ah, oh, how slut Christ loves you. Incredibly. And it just doesn't deepen your appreciation and love for him. This brutal act, I'm not sure what would, but this act shows one how much God hates sin and how much God loves you and I. It says that God demonstrates his love for us that while we were sinners, he died for us. What that means is while you, while you didn't want God, while you were rejecting God, while you were enjoying your sin, he still pushed that aside and said, I'm still going to die for them. That may not have felt fun to you. Maybe not uplifting. But I tell you what, that deepens my love for Christ. And my appreciation for something that at times, if I'm honest, I have taken for granted. I want you at this point to grab anybody and have your cup. So I think this would be a great time to remember what he has done and partake in this. <clears throat> Let's pray real quick. Oh, Father, what do I say? I just feel greatly humble, Lord, that uh, sometimes I don't want to think about those things. Sometimes I want to escape and enjoy my life. Um, but because of it, at times I've taken you for granted. But Lord, thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy, the wonderful gift that we have. Thank you that Christ endured that for us. Thank you for the great patience that you have showed us. Father, as we begin to partake in this, Lord, help us to remember that, Lord, we want to bear fruit for you. We want to be light in the world, Father. We want to be transformed and different. Yet none of those things save us. They're a byproduct of being transformed. But that we are only saved by Christ and what he did. Father, forgive us of everything that our works save us. Help us to put our faith only in Christ and what he did. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you would open up the top there and take the, I don't know what you'd even call this. Wafer. Wafer, piece of bread. Paul said this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, that I received from Jesus that I give to you, that Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke and gave thanks, that this is my body which is broken for you. Do this for remembrance of me. We now take the second part of that until that bad. Jesus also said, after supper, he had taken the cup. He said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is shared for you. As often you eat the bread, drink the cup, and we proclaim Christ's death until he returns. So here's the thing. The cross started brutally, but it ended beautifully. I just want to say that again. The cross started brutally, but it ended beautifully. You want to know why? Because the cross is not the end of the story, is it? Because three days later, when all hope seemed to be lost, and they were despairing, and they were broken and confused and sad, Christ rose. Amen? Yeah. Just give God some praise. Let's go ahead. Come on. Give us some Praise God, that's not the end of the story.
because if it was, this would be a dark message, but it wasn't. In fact, that's just the beginning of the story, not only for him, but for your life. Today is the next day that rest of your life that God wants to use for his glory. Mm-hmm. Now, as the worship team makes their way up here, I want you to remember that when all hope seems gone, because that's what happened to them after he died. They were so confused, disheartened, they went back to their old lives, they thought everything they believed was maybe a lie. But there was hope. So for you, when hope, hope seems gone, remember Christ rose. And whatever you're going through, it's not the end of the story for you or for anybody. It's not the end of the story because Jesus rose and because he lives, we who put our faith in him live also. The resurrection confirms for you and I, one, the price has been paid. Okay? If you put your faith in Christ, you are forgiven and you are made clean. It shows that death has been overcome. You don't have to be afraid of death. That victory is ours. That you have the gift of eternal life. It's not just that he can improve your life now. You have eternity with him. Not only did Jesus take what we deserve, but he doesn't stop there. He says, I'll take your punishment, and I'm going to give you a mansion in heaven. And I'm going to give you eternity with me and the Father. Amen. It shows that we have forgiveness. You don't have to have any more shame. You don't have to have any more guilt. And that we now have a relationship that's been restored to God the Father. That we become his children. And now you get to heaven, but some of you are going to get there and get some rewards. Isn't that cool? I've often said, man, I just want to clean toilets in heaven. I just want to get there. Gabe gets me. He raised his hand. <laughs> Um, you're not going to believe how out of hand it's going to be. It says in Romans 6 that if we have died with Christ, that we also live with him. Because he lives, we live. But now we are to live for God and to God. And we're to do that not just an Easter weekend. But when, Jericho, are we supposed to do that? All day, every day. Amen, right? If you really believe in the resurrection, then your life will show in everything that you do because it's all that matters. I'm going to stop right here. I want to just encourage you. Yes, I guess you called an altar call. If you are saved, praise God for that. I pray that today that you would deepen your love for God and you would share the good news with others. If you have never made that decision to make Christ your Lord and Savior, then do it today. And if you're not sure what that would look like, but I would encourage you to see me, one of the elders, one of the leaders. We'd be happy to pray with you, walk you through that process. And then the final thing I would say today is maybe you made that choice, but you're a prodigal child. Okay? If that's you, then return home today. He loves you and he's waiting for you. Amen. Okay? Now is the time to come back. Anyways, um, that was the brutality of the cross that started brutally, but ended beautifully. Amen. So... This song, um, you might have seen it on Facebook right now. I love you, sir. It makes me rethink the whole life, I guess. Um, but this, um, you might have heard a song called Hallelujah. Um, there's a new version that's going around um, on Facebook. It's the Easter version. Um, we don't have the words that are going to be on the screen. Um, so if you want to just sit um, and take it all in or just Praise him, that's all you can do. Um, I love this song. Um, we know it, I don't practice it like all day today, so um, we're really excited to play it for you, but let's get started.
Great job, guys. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to close in prayer here. Can you put that back up real quick? That, that Christ picture? I don't know, just looking at that, just there's a lot of emotion. It really just, I mean, puts perspective of what he did for us. Now, I know I take it lightly from time to time, but what a good reminder it is to know what he did and what it took to draw us back into a relationship with God. So I know Paul says he preaches Christ crucified. This ain't no just going through the motions thing. This is an all-in thing. So Rob mentioned earlier, those who haven't made a decision yet, feel free to come talk to one of the elders, myself, Ron, Rob, Tim's here, Jesse's here. Um, we can talk with you and go through it. But salvation starts today. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. So let's really look at this, reflect as we go through this weekend. And man, I'm pumped because our King lives, right? Amen. He's alive, so praise Jesus. Um, I'm going to pray real quick, and then after this, we're going to sing happy birthday to Gerald. He turns 50 today. Woo! So I'll close prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I praise you. Lord, just uh, you get the glory for all this. It's all because of what you did 2,000 years ago on that cross, Father. It's hard to grasp, grasp what really happened, what really took place. I think from time to time we think that Okay, yeah, he died for my sin, and that's great. But to really focus on the scriptures and what it says and, and, and what took place and, and what continues to take place in the hearts of people around the world and what has happened since then, Lord, what you continue to do, it, it just blows your mind. Um, and so I hope it stirs us up, Lord, to have more of a desire for those who know you, to truly have a hope that we can't help but to share I was talking with Rob earlier, and I was witnessing at the gym today, and one of the things that came to my mind was, uh, I can't remember exactly where it's at in Scripture, but one of the Gospels talks about where after he rose from the grave, there's two people walking along the road, and Christ was with them walking, but they didn't know right away. But yet, when he disappeared and wasn't there anymore, they said, didn't what he said burn our souls, his words, and what he was saying? I think... When we're witnessing, when we're being a light, when God is using us around other believers, we have that fire that's kindling each other. And we want that fire to keep roaring and going through the kingdom of God, Lord. And I think it's amazing, Father. I think it's awesome that we get three days in a row to be together as a family. Um, I really enjoy this, Lord. And I'm sure others do as well. But, Father, you get the glory for all. And we thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Gerald. Fifth year is we going to come up here? Yeah. <laughs>